Hello. Hello, I'm Elena Balsamo, and you are? I'm Sonia Bilosetakovich. I'm born in Moscow, and, um, and I live in France. So who are you? So I am an American. I'm a writer and a professor. I teach creative writing and mostly the genre of nonfiction. My first book came out last year. It's called On Our Way Home from the Revolution. And it's about the 2014 Maidan revolution in Kiev. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, it's also about my family and my family's sort of history during the Nazi occupation of Ukraine and their journey to America. So it kind of starts in 2014 and then goes back in time and sort of brings it back to the present. Do you have a book that, uh, with you to show me? Sure, I can show you, yeah. Mm, on our way home from the revolution. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. In Russia, I graduated from uh, uh, Moscow State University with uh, Scandinavian languages and literature as the subject. And um, uh, when I settled in France, I got my PhD in the same uh, topic. So since that, for quite a long uh, time, I've been doing the same thing, that is to say, uh, writing and translating. Because there are basically two things that I'm interested in. in to, one is literary history, because it is close to history. And when you come from a country like Russia, you cannot be indifferent to this. And translating comes from the fact that uh, in France, I couldn't discuss books that I like with natives because they don't exist. So what should I do? So I started translating and have been doing it. But since you cannot translate all the books you like, there, that's where the literary criticism comes in. And I do quite a lot because if you cannot translate a book, you can talk about it. Can you tell me a little bit more about all of the language you translate from and to? Because it sounds like you must be a polyglot. You must know like five languages or six or so. Yes, but Scandinavian languages are quite uh, quite similar to each other. So if you know one, then you know the rest of them. Language is an interesting thing and which allows to both to see how different people can think and imagine the same thing in different languages. Translators are like my absolute number one heroes. I'm so excited to be speaking with you because I love translation. I love all the theory behind it. Translation is an interesting mixture of art and craft. That is to say, uh, the art, intuition, talent, uh, sudden inspiration is one thing, and I think it's necessary. Uh, but at the same time, there are techniques. And when I switched from Russian into French, and started uh, writing in French and translating into French, uh, I had to pay the price. And the price is Russian. I cannot translate into Russian which is my uh, uh, first language, mother tongue, uh, that I still practice all the time, but the technique is not there. If I can uh, compare, I would say that translating into French, uh, where I have the technique, I'm like a, um, like a chess speller. That is to say that I consider only a couple of variants of possible moves that I see immediately. And when I try to translate into Russian or uh, into Swedish, into English. I'm like a computer. Well, the computer is very fast, but extremely stupid. So the computer uh, goes through all the 10,000 possible uh, variant. So perhaps at uh, in the end, one comes to something, but it takes an enormous time. It's not a pleasure at all, so that I cannot translate into Russian any longer. What about your Ukrainian? It's a, is it a family Ukrainian? It's family Ukrainian. Family? I, I call it kitchen Ukrainian because I basically have the level of Ukrainian that like a first grader would have, a, a small child. I can, I can get around the kitchen perfectly, but like to have a hot sort of very philosophical conversation in Ukrainian would not be possible for me. But I passively can understand a lot. How did you react when you came to Ukraine to Kiev and everybody around you was speaking Ukrainian? I had heard it so much as a small child that there were sort of routes, I think, in my brain that I already understood, like the car had already driven on a particular road. So it was, in some sense, felt like very natural. There was a kind of feeling of home in a way. There was like a lot of formative memories that were tied in with that language. I used to spend a, every summer with my, my babushka, my Ukrainian grandmother, 
um, and she would speak almost exclusively to me in Ukrainian and I would answer her in English. Um, uh, yeah, I so I was, once I was there in Kiev, you know, it was like hearing some of my earliest memories again. It was sort of being cued in my brain. Um, and of course, when I was there too, then I studied the language and I progressed a lot. Why did you decide to go there? Because where came the interest? Was it because of the family roots and so on? Or because of what was happening there? Because history was on move. It was a coincidence that I happened to be there during a historical moment. So I had spent the year 2011-2012 in Minsk in Belarus, and I was teaching English there. Um, and then I spent the following academic year in Tbilisi, in the Republic of Georgia, and I was working for an educational nonprofit there. And then I was deciding, what am I going to do the year after? Um, and I had heard about this university in Western Ukraine that liked to hire foreigners and had like a really wonderful community. Um, so I applied and got accepted and I thought, okay, great. I will go to the land of my grandmother and my grandfather and learn about my family. And then of course, I had only been there three months when you know the protests began. I mean, the year was different than I ever could have imagined, I guess, too. Have you, have you spent time back in Moscow? Do you go back regularly? Uh, I do go back regularly because I still have family there. And I have many friends uh, in, uh, in Moscow still, but it's, it's always complicated with papers and visa and everything. So I still have a feeling that it's a far away that it's much easier to go anywhere in this planet than to go to Russia. What is the news from Russia these days? What are, what are your friends and family on the ground saying? How, how are they coping with what's happening? Uh, they used to ask me questions about what's happening in Russia. And that, that's a very old oh. pattern. Because uh, after all the Soviet years and uh, the Putin years, people simply don't uh, trust whatever they uh, hear. Even they are quite good and sensitive information, they don't trust. So they ask, should one really wear a mask? And so if you say yes, then they s uh, feel somehow secure. People are extremely nervous, hysterical. Uh, they don't know what's going on, so sometimes they exaggerate and think that everybody is contaminated. Uh, others think that all these are some intrigues from uh, the part of the government and one shouldn't care about it at all. The only real uh, statistics that can be trusted is what doctors count, not uh, people that die, but doctors that die. If you have a, a number of uh, doctors that died from coronavirus, then you, you can mathematically extrapolate and uh, imagine what happened with the rest. One of the main uh, uh, results and effects of my moving from Russia to, to the West is that I do trust the police, I do trust the authorities, and uh, not that I think that I, they are particularly smart. They try to do the best in most cases, which one unfortunately cannot say about U.S. today. I have great faith in the press in the U.S. I mean, I think that, I think translators and journalists are like all <laughs> as superheroes to me. Um, but unfortunately, I, I don't think American people can or should trust their local police forces, which are, you know, heavily, heavily militarized. Do you have any information from Ukraine? For the most part, it seems like it's being taken pretty seriously. My friends are also very concerned, of course, because the medical facilities have no capacity to really deal with a, a serious spike. And what do you think of the political situation in general after Zelensky uh, came to power? I'm pretty cynical because Zelensky still has so many oligarch ties and hasn't really been implementing the reforms that people want him to. But I guess one thing that he, has done in a way that seems important is simply he has said and put forward language of transparency. You know, he even if it's just lip service, he at least talks about values that I agree with. In that way, it's like he sort of made it possible to imagine and demand those things, right? When he doesn't live up to them, the people can can say we need to hold you accountable. Whereas I'm contrasting this to the US where we don't expect anything of our president and there, because he, he doesn't say democratic things, didn't have a language 
that uh, we can hold him accountable for. He says all of the evil things and then does the evil thing. He was very upset about uh, the former ambassador to Ukraine. Um, and one thing that I, no I noticed when he was talking on Fox News, he said that she didn't hang my portrait in the embassy in Kiev. She refused to hang it. She's like a terrible person because she didn't hang up my portrait. And I remember <laughs> hearing that and thinking, oh, this reminds me exactly of the opposite of something Zelensky said in his inaugural address, which was, do not hang portraits of me in your office. Hang portraits of your children there. And before you make a decision, look them in the eye. And I just remember thinking, wow, like these are the exact opposite values being displayed. And, and again, I think I'm a bit cynical because he, he, that's a line from his television show, The Servant of the People, right? But someone at some point imagined that and understood that it was a powerful idea and he was reusing it in his actual inaugural speech. And the contrast between that and the words coming out of Trump's mouth were just, to, I mean, to me, it sort of said everything that one needed to know about the impeachment trial in the first place. One can also think that Zelensky is uh, as a good president as one could have in Ukraine in this historical period because miracles do not happen uh, often. Uh, in Czechoslovakia, it happened with uh, Haaland. Yeah. So Zelensky is on his place and let's hope only that, uh, that something will go on in this country. How did you get interested in uh, the Scandinavian languages and literatures? That was also a, a kind of a political decision because uh, uh, you know, the, the education in the Soviet Union, uh, when it came to the languages, was very good. Uh, so I started with English. That was the time of uh, Soviet Union expansion in Africa. And I saw all my fellow students that were uh, from French section that were taught uh, Portuguese very quickly and sent as uh, interpreters to uh, different African countries. And so they had to translate for Russian military and Russian engineers and so on. And I said, no, I don't want uh, uh, this. What should I do? And then I looked up at the map and I thought, well, Scandinavia, that looks nice. <laughs> and uh, at, that, at that time, they are um, creating a, a Swedish group. And then I began to read and then I discovered wonderful uh, Scandinavian literature. And so I feel myself on the safe side because I didn't think the Soviet Union would try to invade uh, Sweden in the coming years. And then Finland was there. Every linguistic area is a world of its own, with history, with uh, future, with literature. And uh, if you know one of them, even a small one, then you have an idea of the world, li world literature. Do you then consider studying history as part of the required work that you must do as a translator? Oh yes, uh, surely. And that, that was one of the things that I appreciate with this Soviet educational methods because uh, it was a complex one. You choose, for instance, uh, Swedish, then you have to uh, learn uh, old Icelandic because it's the mother of all Scandinavian languages and then uh, history of the language and uh, history of the country and literature. So it all becomes a, a kind of a complex building. And, and luckily enough, since I started with English, I had uh, also this, that is to say, old English and, um, and uh, uh, Gothic language, of which we have only two small texts, uh, but still we, st we studied Gothic language in Moscow in the 18th century. So absolutely unimaginable. Wow. It was an education that didn't have any connection with the real life. What would you do with somebody who could uh, draw uh, old Icelandic runic uh, wow. uh, scriptures in uh, the country that was building socialists? So it was diff <laughs> difficult to imagine. Sweden always comes up in conversation among people in sort of the American left as sort of this like utopia country where everything works well and everybody feels respected. What is your impression? 
Sweden is a small country, so many things that uh, work quite well there would never work uh, in other place. Iceland is a paradise in some ways because uh, the Iceland population is 300,000 people, so quite uh, organizable. And uh, Sweden is a, a nice place to, to live and uh, nature is beautiful, uh, culture is okay and literature. But there is also this kind of conformity, which is sometimes quite frustrating. To make a Swede to do something which is uh, not according to the rules, even if his life depends on it, is not always easy. For a while was, you know, very sort of fascinated and almost obsessed with your um, Anna Polikovskaya and her reporting from Chechnya. Yeah. I've read a lot of her books. What do you think um, about the Nobel Prize or Belarusian winner? Yeah, I, I really like her work. I think it's beautiful. Um, that was really exciting. What do you think? I, I think it's, it's wonderful because it's, uh, it's literature, it's not journalism. And uh, there are some things that are extraordinary. That's why I, I love nonfiction so much and why I write nonfiction because it's so beautiful what you can curate with you know real quotes, real events and trying to put that together in a literary way. To me it's like such a fun challenge. I really like uh, Serhe Jadan, who's a contemporary poet. He has a really interesting vision. He's also like a punk rock musician on the side. And I mean, he's like, of course, he's very politically active. He was a protester. He's a really interesting character. I think his poetry is lovely. Oh, well, the, the poet that I did a little bit of translating of some of her work, just really just for fun. Um, her name is uh, Luba Yakumchuk. She lived in Eastern Ukraine um, in the Donbass and she had to flee in 2014 during the war. And she started writing this poetry about her home, which she was exiled from essentially. And she was putting it on Facebook. She was using social media to share this poetry. And I just found it really interesting, the, the way that the idea of being apart from home, being exiled, and also using a medium uh, like Facebook to, to share that work with the people who were back home. There's some really beautiful images in her work. You can actually just look her up online and read a lot of her poetry for free, yeah. I discovered a manuscript in a Swedish university library which described life in Northern Africa by the Swedish uh, diplomat from the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, it said, it's wonderful. What was really amazing was that at the same time, I discovered a Danish uh, musician who was there as a diplomat at the same time, who describes in his letters home in the 1816, the epitome of uh, plug in Algeria, in the Northern Africa. I found this text exactly when the epitome broke out. And there were these parallels between what I was discovering by reading and what I was discovering by, by experiencing life and uh, uh, not being able to, uh, to go anywhere, not being able to travel and so on and so forth. The last book I read was an American novel called Severance, and it's by a Chinese American author named Ling Ma. It came out in 2018 and it's all about uh, a respiratory pandemic the parallels and the insight, I guess, from it. And having the fact that it was written several years ago was, was just fascinating, right? To watch what's going on in my daily life, to read that book and having them be in conversation with each other was, um, it was really a powerful experience. And then I uh, reread a lot of classics. I realized at some moment I, that all those books that I read as a child and liked so much and reread and uh, could almost by heart that I read all of them in Russian. So I started reading <laughs> classics in uh, English, Swedish, German, and so on. Sometimes it's just the same. Sometimes it's not as good as one thought. And sometimes one discovers quite a new book. The Treasure Island we read in translation has nothing to do with uh, Stevenson. We have to say goodbye and uh, it was too short, I, I find, but it, anyway. Uh, so good luck for everything you do and um, thank you you too we have to have another uh, not blind date yeah yeah that would be really nice it was really a pleasure speaking with you thank you yeah, the same for me so goodbye you too bye good luck <laughs>